Hello, I'm Howie and welcome to Soundbite. Today we're going to be looking at the subject of lament. We live in uncertain times. As Sally, my better half, often reminds me, uncertainty is the only thing we can be certain of. It's what anthropologists and theologians refer to as liminal space. It's probably worth explaining what that is a bit in everyday language. So here's an analogy. Imagine a ship. It starts off in a harbour. It's taking on provisions and crew. All is good. You're one of the crew. The ship then sets sail. It leaves the harbour and heads for the high seas. The sun's shining. All's good. Eventually you lose sight of land. You have to trust in the captain's ability to navigate. Then the storms come because they always do. The sea gets rougher and the waves get higher. The lightning and rain starts. The skies grow dark and you can't see. Some of these storms at sea can be massive. In some instances a thousand miles across with waves a hundred feet high and they can last for a week. With no way of knowing when it will end or where you are Again, you have to place your trust in the captain's navigation skills, the navigation equipment, the radio comms to get you through. Perhaps you even begin to cry out to God to be saved. It can seem bleak and without hope, but eventually the storms pass because they always do. You see land again and eventually the safety of a port comes into sight and you make for it. Back in the safety of the port, you take stock. You reflect on your experiences. You fix what's been broken. You rest and you recover. Now it'd be very easy to remain in the port and not venture out again for fear of what might happen. But ships weren't meant to stay in port and calm seas do not a good sailor make. So eventually the ship sets out once more. Liminality makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. Hard questions about who God is, hard questions about who we are, and hard questions about the world we live in. It's important because it's only on the high seas of life that we're stripped of our safety nets, where we're forced to rely on God, and where we come face to face with both God and ourselves. It's where real transformation takes place, but it's so easy to avoid and remain in port and take the safe option. But the times we live in mean we can't stay in port. Many of us try and adopt the British stiff upper lip. I'm not saying there isn't a place for it. It's more a case of when should we employ it. You see, when we ignore our struggles, our anxieties, our fears, they can take on a life of their own and become unmanageable. Unattended to, they can lead to depression and despair. If we face them though, with God's help, they can be cut down to size and we can gain a right perspective on them. God can help us navigate our way through difficult times. Trouble is, as Christians, we can sometimes be guilty of putting God-shaped sticking plasters on the big stuff and this nearly always makes matters worse. When we fail to listen properly to people and their struggles, it can lead to feelings of anger, frustration and depression in those we're trying to help. If people aren't listened to, they can feel devalued, like they don't matter. If we then begin to qu start quoting Bible verses, it can leave people feeling that their worries are trivial. Worse still, for those with faith, it can leave them feeling judged and it can make people doubt their own faith rather than actually affirming and blessing them. This is especially true when it comes to new Christians who often have a lot to talk about because we all have a past. It's not great when we do this to each other within the Christian community, but it's definitely not good news when we do this to people who are exploring the Christian faith 
or who have written Christianity off, in these circumstances we can inadvertently do a lot of damage. Talking to mates who don't have a faith, most have had an experience like this, and this is what it tends to communicate to them. That Christianity has nothing to offer, that Christians don't understand the real world, we're often seen as living in a bubble that's far removed from their struggles, and we're increasingly seen as irrelevant. Now this pains me, as I'm sure it will pain most of my brothers and sisters in the faith. I know that we all want to help and encourage people, especially when we know just how much Jesus has helped us. But we can't ignore this kind of feedback if our faith is to truly impact the lives of our friends and family. Now none of what I've shared undermines the truth of Scripture. God's truth is real and concrete, we all know this. But we do need to learn how and when to share these truths, if they're to be of benefit. Get it wrong and we can end up inadvertently putting another obstacle in the way of people coming to faith. We need to exercise wisdom as to when we should speak and learn to listen first. A good rule of thumb is to wait until people actually start asking you questions and inviting you to comment. And this may take more time than you realise, so be prepared. At this point, I have to admit, I find this exhausting. Partly because, once I get going, I talk for England. I'm a natural extrovert. And partly because, to listen well, I really have to hold myself in check. I've got better at it over the years. I've had quite a bit of training. But from time to time, I have to revisit this. I have to be honest about that. If it doesn't come naturally to you, then try doing something like an Acorn Listener's Course. Now salvation, as we know, is a free gift from God, but, and this is a big but, we have to earn the right to speak into people's lives, whether they're from part of our own faith communities or whether they're outside of the church. Too often we assume this right, perhaps we even demand it and it often compounds the problems. Okay, so you're probably sitting there feeling a bit fed up with me and thinking, okay, we get it, there's a problem. We need to do things differently. So what's the solution? Well, the good news is that the Bible does indeed have much to say on the subject. Within the pages of the Bible, there's real wisdom for us to tap into. I think the first thing we need to do is acknowledge that the Bible often is more honest about pain and struggle than we are. I think sometimes we don't like to talk about difficult stuff in case it somehow undermines who God is. Trust me, it won't. For example, in the Gospel of John we read of Jesus seeing his friends Martha and Mary weeping at the death of their brother Lazarus. And the Bible says that being moved to tears, he was weeping with them. Now that's not very British stiff upper lip, not very British at all really. Elsewhere in the Book of Lamentations, a book which I thoroughly commend to you, it's got a lot to teach us about how we handle grief. In chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, we read, He ground my face into the gravel. He pounded me into the mud. I gave up on life altogether. I've forgotten what the good life is like. I said to myself, this is it. I'm finished. God is a lost cause. Try putting a sticking plaster on that. This is a man who is struggling and is lamenting and is expressing his grief passionately to God. And God's okay with that. Elsewhere we read in Matthew chapter 27 verse 46. But when Jesus is on the cross suffering the agony of crucifixion, he cries out to God our Heavenly Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? An anguished cry of the heart for sure and totally different to our keep calm and carry on culture. If Jesus can do it, if Jesus can express pain and struggle, then we should be honest and do it too. Then we have the book of Psalms, the hymn book of God's people, which contains songs which really don't gloss over anything. Within the Psalms you'll encounter every human emotion known. You'll see firsthand people facing up to their brokenness and their failures. Psalms guide us and show us how to lament, how to handle our struggle, and most importantly, how to include God in them in a healthy way. The Psalms as a book 
can be split into three main sections. Psalms of Orientation. These focus on the true nature of God and his creation. They remind us of God's character, his goodness and his faithfulness. And when we're under the cosh and struggling, sometimes we really need to be reminded of that. Then there are Psalms of Disorientation or Psalms of Lament. And this is by far the biggest section of the 150 Psalms. And these address the very real struggles of pain, grief, heartache, disappointment and bitterness. The stuff we all experience when life throws us a curveball, which invariably it does. Finally, there are Psalms of Reorientation, which express the feelings of gratitude and surprise when we finally emerge from a period of struggle. Scripture is a gift to us and can help us navigate the difficult seasons of our lives and it can be of huge comfort to us and others but we need wisdom and discernment to know when to speak truth and importantly when to stay silent and just sit with those who are in pain and simply listen and pray for them. We aren't always great at this. The desire to fix people and make the pain go away can be huge. It's not wrong, it comes from the right place, it's just not always helpful. One of my favourite psalms is Psalm 23 which contains the famous verse, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We see here that God doesn't spare us difficult times, but he does promise to be with us. My experience is but God is often in the process, as painful as that might be, and God uses experiences to shape and mould us. Like I said earlier, calm seas do not a good sailor make. When we try quick fixes, we can end up inadvertently working against what God might be trying to do in somebody's life. We need to be careful that we don't reduce God to some kind of cosmic sugar daddy expecting him to wave a magic wand whenever we're in trouble. Frankly, if he did that, I'd be doing crazy stuff all of the time if I had a get out of jail card. If we do this, we'll be sorely disappointed because that's not how God works, but we'll also fail to grow and mature. And as our Heavenly Father, God is always seeking to help us become the men and women he created us to be. So in closing, Let's learn what it is to lament, to express our fears, our anxieties, our pain and our disappointments passionately, both individually and as a community, to God, because he can take it. And actually, that's what this world needs at the moment. So many people have pains, fears, anxieties and disappointments, and they don't know how to deal with it. We can lead the way. Let's give each other permission to lament and not shut people down when they struggle. Once we've heard people and gained their trust and earned the right to speak, then let's share God's wisdom with people when they ask for it. And finally, let's pray for each other, for our mates and for the world we live in. As ever, if this has raised any questions for you, then please do get in touch. We're more than happy to listen and to help out as best we can. We may not always have the answer, in fact, we often won't, but we are prepared to walk with you and support you as you wrestle with God for yourself and find the peace that he ultimately brings us. Right, I'm out of here. Stay safe. <laughs>
Stay the same.